Welcome back to Moonlight Lore, everyone. As always, I'm your host, Jordan Hopkins. In this episode, we are picking back up where we left off last week in this part three of the topic pertaining to the Lost Lemon Gold Mine hidden somewhere in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Now, if you haven't listened to the past two episodes, I highly recommend you do so, so you can understand and follow what we'll be talking about on this episode. But I will give a brief explanation for what this topic is all about for anyone new coming in. To give a bullet point explanation, two prospectors back in the 1870s named Lemon and Blackjack had traveled up from Montana into Alberta to take part in a hunt for gold. The two split off from the main group and headed into the Rocky Mountains on their way to Tobacco Plains. During their travels, they discovered an unimaginable amount of gold, which would have made them two of the richest people in the world back then, and including in the present day. Unfortunately, neither were able to recover more than a few handfuls after Lemon betrayed Blackjack and killed him in his sleep, then went completely mad over the next few years after trying to find the site again. Since then though, those who have gone out searching for the treasure would only ever return empty-handed. Rumors say there's a curse protecting the treasure causing many people to die unexpectedly, preventing further searches for the gold to ever be successful. Now, as I talked about in the last episode, there are many, many variations of the story of how Lemon had found his treasure. It's nearly impossible to know which version of the events actually took place, which has led historians and treasure hunters befuddled in trying to solve this mystery. In the last and first episodes, I mainly focused on the stories shared by the white prospectors and traders and their desperate search for the gold. But we can't ignore the group of people who have been in the area for centuries and who have had major roles in many of the stories that have popped up over the course of 150 years. In this episode, I want to focus more on stories involving the local Native American population and their involvement with the gold people have been desperately looking for. A little known story talking about the gold actually comes from a woman who claimed to have been Lemon's wife and who had been there when he had discovered the bounty. This story takes us down south a little from Crow's Nest Pass to the Blood Tribe Reservation near Cardston, Alberta. This story emerges from the Leftbridge Herald in January of 1960, written by Florence Crossing a woman who had lived in the Crow's Nest and Pincher Creek area back in the late 18 and early 1900s. During her time here, she would go on to write about many events taking place, including some stories of Native American folklore. It's in one of her writings she claims her mother had taken in a blood tribe woman and her son after having escaped the long strenuous journey through the wilderness to reach safety after certain events took place where she lost her husband and killed the man responsible. Eiko Schoon A blood tribe woman and her 11-year-old son claimed to have met Lemon and his partner during their time in Alberta. Both her and Lemon would go on to marry each other, as was often the case for many prospectors during this time as it afforded them resources and the safety of one passing through or working in a tribe's territory. After the ceremony, Lemon, his unnamed partner, Ekoskun, and her son would travel by horseback up into the mountains and to a small ramshackle cabin sitting a little way off the First Nations pack trail. It's there the four of them would settle down for a while, as Lemon and his partner wish to survey the land and dig around for any traces of minerals. Their time there was filled with work. Eiko Schoon and her son were constantly busy cutting wood for the fire, washing and cleaning clothes, preparing meals, and in their limited free time, spent it sewing moccasins and other clothing for the two miners. One day, when Lemon's partner had been out in the forest searching for gold, Lemon dug through the floor of the cabin lifting wooden boards and dirt to create his very own hiding spot for any treasure he might find. He showed this spot to Ekoskun and her son, but kept it secret from his partner. A few weeks passed by and Lemon had made the discovery of a lot of gold, and was able to stow it away in his hiding spot before his partner caught wise to the situation. Since food was running low around this point, Lemon instructed Ekoskun and her son to go tend to the horses while he went out and hunted some wild game in the woods. However, Lemon left behind his partner too, who by this time grew suspicious why the other three were in fairly higher spirits than he was, and figured out Lemon had been finding large sums of gold and hiding it all away from him. Ekoskun, as she was tending to the horses, watched as Lemon's partner entered the small cabin and walked back out seconds later carrying his rifle. From the look on his face, she knew something was about to happen, but as she had no weapon herself and feared for her son's safety, 
she pretended not to see the men and returned to her work. Moments later, she heard gunshots cry out from the woods, unsure if the shot was at a wild animal or at her husband. Her question would then be soon answered as she watched Lemon's partner emerge from the woods with a grim look on his face. He looked at her and ordered her to make him some supper, as he stated he was going to leave in the morning. Aiko Schoon complied, fearing for her life and her son's, as well as the still warm rifle sitting in the lap of the man, and made him some food. Upon completing his dinner, he told her to begin packing his supplies up to be ready for travel, and disappeared into the cabin. The sun had fully disappeared behind the mountains now, and with no sign of Lemon coming from the woods, and Aiko Schoon knew for sure he wasn't coming back, and hearing Lemon's partner tear the ramshackle cabin apart inside, obviously looking for Lemon's stash, she knew his anger in not finding it would then come to her and her son. She told her son to grab a plate of food and a blanket, and to head into the woods to hide, while she grabbed more supplies. The two slept in the dark cold woods that night and listened to the yells of the man who killed her husband, now looking for her and her son, in hopes they would be able to tell him where Lemon had stashed his gold. Eventually, the old miner gave up his search and returned to camp. And come early morning, Aiko Schoon instructed her son to remain in the woods while she goes back to camp to prepare breakfast. As she was in the middle of cooking, the miner woke up and demanded to know where the treasure was. Aiko Schoon told him she would share what she knew, but only after breakfast, to which she told the man to fetch the plates and cups in the bag sitting on the stump a few feet behind him. Hesitantly, the man got up and walked to the bag to begin rummaging around for the dishes. This was Aiko Schoon's plan and quietly approached the man digging through the bag, unknowing Aiko Schoon was right behind him with an axe high above her head. And with all of her might, Aiko Schoon brought down the wood splitting axe and split open the man's skull. Making sure her husband's murderer was now properly dead, Aiko Schoon called for her son to return to camp where they would search for Lemon's body, wrap him in a blanket and bury him in the ground with the gold placed onto his chest. As the two finished, they packed their gear and rode a short ways west, where Aiko Schoon instructed her son to wait for her while she returned to the cabin alone. She didn't want him to see what she was about to do. Upon returning back to the camp, she went to the grave of her husband and promised he would keep his gold forever. She placed a curse upon the land and the gold, stating no white man could ever recover the treasure and would be met with insanity or death if they tried. Only after her husband's spirit was fully at rest, and his bones turned to dust, would someone with First Nations blood be able to recover the treasure? And now taking the leftover bags of blasting powder the two miners had, she placed the bags at the base of a large rock cliff, lit the fuse, and ran. She retreated safely out of the blast zone, and felt the earth rumble as the rocks from the cliff of the mountain came down, destroying the cabin and completely covering the location where the two dead miners rested. Satisfied she had finished what she needed to do, Aiko Schoon rode back to her son, where the two made the long migration north. After a very strenuous and long journey that nearly brought the two to death's doorstep due to terrible weather and setback after setback, the pair eventually made it to where the town of Coleman would be later built, arriving hungry and tired at the doorstep of Florence Crossing's mother, who took the two in and helped nurse them back to health. It apparently took some time before Aiko Schoon and her son were well enough to travel back down south to the reservation near Cardston but they managed to do so, and then returned up to the Coleman area three years later to thank Florence's mother and gift her with traditional native clothing, woven baskets, necklaces, and other items. And Aiko Schoon's generosity didn't stop there. She asked Florence's mother to accompany her and a group from her reservation who were returning to the site of Lemon's grave. Aiko Schoon mentioned she wished to retrieve a special axe that used to belong to Lemon and believed they would be able to find it again. And by this time, Florence, the woman who brings us this story, is old enough to travel with the band, and too accompanies her mother and the blood natives to the site where Lemon rests. It took a few days of travel, and then a few more days of searching and clearing rubble away, but eventually the entire party walked away empty-handed, with no axe being found, and no treasure recovered.
Eiko Skun's experience and the story brought to light from Florence is indeed intriguing, as it would place Florence herself at the site of the gold. And since she was able to make a journey like that and for her to remember the story to write decades later, means that she would have been at an old enough age to remember such things. However, there's one issue here. Florence Croson was born in 1895, meaning it would have been around the year 1900 or even later for her to be of age to remember such events and travel by horseback. Now the issue here is the first newspaper clippings of the Lost Lemon Gold Mine had come out years before Florence was even born. For just an example, at the end of the last episode I discussed a news clipping taken from the Calgary Herald regarding the Lemon Gold Mine. This article came out in 1886, meaning the gold mine was well known at least a decade before Florence was even born, meaning her story about Eiko Schoon's experience happening in 1892 or 91 could have just simply not have happened. And now I share this point not to point out someone had lied or exaggerated for the purpose of selling a story, but to drive home the point that stories surrounding the lost lemon mine are usually inaccurate, often distorted, and more than likely false. And so with this point, I hope I've made you, the listener, realize just how hard it's been for historians and treasure hunters to actually track down the truth of this mystery and why it's eluded so many for the past 150 years. Now as for this next story, it's not exactly clear if the gold mentioned in it was in fact from the lost lemon gold, but it had been considered a possibility considering the area and the amount revealed. In January of 1894, a harsh snowstorm gripped the south of Alberta causing shortages of food and supplies to become a common occurrence to everyone. By this time, the wild buffalo which had populated the province for hundreds of years and provided sustenance for the local native tribes in the area had all been wiped out. This then caused the local tribes to barely get by, by hunting smaller games such as rabbits, grouse, and other creatures that would only sustain a few members of the tribe for a single meal. The federal government had promised to replace herds of now extinct buffalo with cattle, but as was quite often back then, the government's promises would occasionally fall through, leaving the tribe's only source of food being whatever they could find. By this time in later January, the rabbits and grouse had all been hunted and finding food had become increasingly difficult with each day. The elders, sick and young were slowly dying off, and with the clear absence of aid from the government, and with the heavy snow preventing the entire tribe from traveling, the chieftain of the Cree tribe situated south of Calgary instructed two of his Cree braves to travel north and head to Bowdoin to trade for the supplies they desperately needed. The two braves traveled alone with eight pack horses for several days in the bitter freezing cold known to grip the province. Now just for a reference on how cold it can get here in Alberta, in my area every couple of years or so it makes it onto the top 10 list of coldest places on earth for a few days. So as you can imagine, for these two Cree braves traveling by horseback for hundreds of kilometers in a freezing blizzard for several days, they weren't in a very good shape. If it hadn't been for a homesteader named Colin Thompson, who found the pair and offered the two sanctuary in his home, they surely would have perished with their eight horses. And also at the home was a trapper named Henning, who had been visiting Thompson for the past several days. As the two braves warmed themselves up by the fire and shared a meal with the two men, a conversation understandably drifted to why they had been out in the cold in the first place. Thompson, being well fluent in the Cree language, was able to carry on a conversation about the two Cree's hardship and their tribe's problems plaguing them this winter. They told them they were on their way to Bowdoin to trade for some supplies. Thompson, probably a bit confused as he had helped stow their horses away from the wind, had noticed before all eight horses weren't carrying any supplies such as furs for them to trade for the trader. Questioning this, the two Crees told him the horses were mainly for the return trip to bring the supplies back. To which Thompson warned them the trader out in Bowdoin wasn't particularly fond of natives and wasn't likely to offer them supplies out of the kindness of his heart. Hesitantly, the older of the braves pulled out a buckskin bag and opened it to reveal it was full of golden nuggets. Wide-eyed, Thompson and Henning both looked at them in disbelief as this was the most gold either had ever seen. Henning spoke up first and excitedly asked where the two had managed to find so much gold, to which the two braves responded saying they had gotten it from a sacred valley. Pressing more questions about the whereabouts of this valley and the treasure, the two braves became reluctant to reveal anymore, only answering with non-committal answers saying the sacred valley was an old Native American burial ground, and that they didn't know exactly where the gold was from as only their chief and the tribe's medicine man knew of its location but Henning knew there must be plenty more to be found in this secret valley. 
The biggest problem was he had no idea where these two braves came from, only the direction where he and Thompson had seen them coming from. And so Henning offered the two everything he owned at the moment, his rifle, pack horse, supplies, if they would just take him to the location of the gold. And now maybe sensing his selfish and ill intentions, the two braves remained silent and decided they were rested enough and left immediately to head to Bowdoin 15 kilometers away. Henning, seeing nothing but dollar signs in his eyes, decided he would hide and wait for the two braves to return from their trip and discreetly follow them back to their tribe in hopes of finding out the general area the gold was supposed to be in. But perhaps it was the foresight of the two native men who knew Henning would more than likely try to follow them, or a bit of bad luck on Henning's part, but the two Cree men never did return past Thompson's homestead. It's believed the two had made it to Bowdoin, and then traveled a different route to avoid anyone following them home. It wasn't until several years later when Thompson encountered the two men he took in that winter, and they informed him the gold they traded for supplies did indeed save the tribe that winter, and that their sacred valley where the gold was said to be, had remained untouched by any white man. And now according to the Bowdoin Historical Society, this wasn't the only encounter Thompson would have with two Cree men carrying large sums of gold. Now I myself am not sure if this story comes before or after the one I just shared, but Thompson had been visiting the Bowdoin trader one day to barter goods with other trappers and prospectors when two Cree men entered the trading post carrying a bag of what's called red gold. Now red gold is gold that contains small specks of copper, giving the gold a rusty red look in some parts of it. This was apparently an uncommon type of gold because when the two Cree men finished picking out their supplies they needed from the traders and exchanged the gold for them, the tidal wave of questions from the excited prospectors filled the room. The two Crees were hesitant to tell any of them the location where they had gotten their gold, and eventually, after so much prying, the pair quickly rode off and away from the trader. But the handful of prospectors were determined to get an answer, and rode off after them. Neither groups were ever seen again after that. Some speculate the Cree men had killed the white men after their pestering and demanding answers, or that the white men had killed the two Crees after having learned the location of gold so they could mine it undisputed. With these two accounts of natives in the area revealing they had access to gold, it had led some to believe the Cree tribe knew of a location where the lost lemon mine might actually be. This sacred valley the Cree ancestors were buried in over the years could possibly be the very same valley Lemon and Blackjack had discovered their original find way back then. In an article appearing in the Golden West magazine written by Bob Canton, he believes this to be the case. In his article he writes, the old mountain rocky house was situated on the North Saskatchewan River, a well-known gold-bearing stream in the eastern side of the Rockies. To the south and west of the Rocky Mountain House are other gold-bearing streams, all flowing easterly. But to the south and west of Morley, a Native American reservation, there are no gold-bearing streams east of the Continental Divide. The old Indian trail which leads south of Rocky Mountain House traverses both these areas. Is it not reasonable to assume that Blackjack and Lemon could have followed one of these more northerly streams to the Motherlode, the sacred spot of the Crees, and perhaps the Stony Indians? Now Blackjack and Lemon were Americans, working out of Fort Benton and Tobacco Plains. Normally they would have headed home by the quickest route, this is referencing when they separated their original group at the North Saskatchewan River and headed south with the Métis towards Tobacco Plains. The shortest road home was in a southerly direction. Whether the two started from Mist Mountain, High River, or the Rocky Mountain House, to get to Fort Benton from High River or the area near Mist Mountain, they would have had traveled southeasterly towards Fort McLeod, Fort Kipp, and Fort Hamilton, which is now known as Fort Whoopup, and then had traveled south on the wagon road heading towards Fort Benton. Being about 75 miles or more south of Morleyville, it's unlikely that Chief Bear's Paw would have always been aware of their presence in that area. But on the other hand, if they came from west of Bowdoin and traveled south to either Fort Benton or to the territory, the Indian trail from Rocky Mountain House passed directly through Morleyville. Could we not further assume that the mine could be somewhere near this northernmost trail, 
possibly 100 miles west of Bowdoin, which figured in the starving Cree men spending time at Thompson's homestead. There is gold in the area south of the Rocky Mountain House, but none in the area south of Morley. At the present time, with the information and guidance of a friend and hunting companion, we recently found a valley in the mountains west of Bowdoin that has all the known requirements of the lost lemon mine. A once well-traveled trail, long abandoned and overgrown, and the confluence of three creeks, like on the map Lafayette French owned and claimed to have been drawn by Lemon himself. This valley is somewhere west of Red Lodge Provincial Park, at a distance of about eight days' ride. But what's most important of all, there is a hole that looks suspiciously like a mine entrance nestled high on the side of a mountain. Upon finding this location, the men were excited, but didn't attempt to climb the mountain, as when they spotted the entrance to the cave, it was the month of June, and the chance of an avalanche was very high. Instead, they planned to return later in the summer to attempt to climb an expedition, but decided to keep it secret as to avoid unwanted attention from other eager treasure hunters. Now what's extremely interesting about this valley is a man who has direct link to the lost lemon mine had been spending quite a large chunk of his life here. King Bearspaw, the son of Chief Moses Bearspaw and grandson to Chief Jacob's Bearspaw, the man responsible for giving the order to hide the grave of Blackjack and covering up the possible location of the lemon mine. Now King Bearspaw would go on to spend 70 years of his life in this valley Bob Canton talks about in his article. As the last surviving link to the original story, the grandson of Chief Jacob's Bearpaw most likely wouldn't have spent seven decades of his life in search for the gold strictly in this valley if he didn't have a very good idea the gold was here. And it would make sense, before his death at 89 years old in April of 1979, King Bearspaw had some clue that tipped him off that this was indeed the location of the treasure. Otherwise, why would he have spent so much time here? According to an interview with King Bearspaw, he began searching in the area back in 1907, and always had an intense fascination with the stories his grandfather would tell, and an intense drive to find the gold for himself. In an article from the Nanton News back in 1959, King Bearspaw is quoted saying, I've had it in my blood since I was a boy. It's been a dream to me all my life, and I guess I'd sooner look for the lost lemon mine than do anything else. My grandmother said it was all right to look for it, my mother told me not to look for the mine because if I found it, the gold would bring unhappiness and maybe death. I've kept on looking all these years. I don't think the gold would have done me any harm if I'd found it. The interviewer then asks Bearpaw if whether or not he believed the lost mine really existed or not, to which Bearspaw responded saying, Oh yes, it's there, somewhere. My grandfather knew where it was, but he would never tell anyone where. He told me all about it except where the mine was. He and his two brothers knew. One of the brothers saw the murder committed over the gold Lemon and Blackjack found. None of them would tell where this gold was. Further in the interview, King Bear's Paul went on to say there's not much interest in this story nowadays. He believed his grandfather didn't keep the location of the mine a secret because he simply didn't like the gold or white men, but rather because if the gold was found, he knew it would cause another gold rush. And they've seen it before. The treasure hunters and gold seekers would invade the area paying no care to the land around them and causing the good hunting grounds to be completely destroyed. King Bearspaw would end the interview with saying this, He had no use for the gold, but I have. Chief Jacob's bear paw had passed down the knowledge of the location where the gold rests to his son, Chief Moses Bear's paw, but neither would pass down the secret to King's bear paw, knowing his vocal interest in finding it. Back when he turned 31, King Bear's paw gave up his rights as a treaty native in 1921, allowing him to travel off his reservation to search the backcountry and mountains for the gold, ignoring the strict warnings given to him by his father and grandfather. It's here I think I will end the episode so we can pick up next week with more theories and more modern day attempts to find the treasure. As always, it's been a pleasure to share this story with you guys and I hope you've been enjoying this series. But while you wait for the next episode, if you could leave a 5 star review on iTunes and share the podcast with your friends and family, it would go a long ways to help the podcast grow and to bring more people into exploring the unknown. 
Also, if you're interested, you could give the podcast a follow on Instagram at Moonlight Lore Podcast or on Twitter by following at Lore Moonlight. So until next episode, everyone, take care, keep your lanterns lit, and keep exploring the unknown. <laughs>